As far as techniques to control erosion as part of that reactive part of wildfire response, a lot of times on these large fires we have large heavy capacity helicopters, type 1 helicopters including K-Max heavy lift helicopters and Chinooks. And for a large incident you usually have the funding to keep these helicopters on hand for days after your most severe fire activity. And in this time we've seen benefit for hydro seeding, hydro mulching, um, spreading of hay bales or um, millet or sterilized you know, wheat grains, any sort of stabilizing um, structure to help uh, decrease erosion potential in sensitive areas. And usually what I've seen and had the privilege to talk to people walking around the inside of these burns, usually they don't like to talk to us, um, you know, chainsaw artists, because we're pretty dirty and smelly by 10 days into a fire. But uh, some the like Trout Unlimited, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, a lot of these conservation uh, organizations will provide matching funding for the home agency to provide these erosion controls above, say, a sensitive drainage that has a specific genetic trait in its cutthroat trout, or say it's a uh, an elk wintering ground, and we can't just have this whole slope slough off and go into the stream. So that funding during that you know critical crux, because as we saw in, for instance, last summer, the 416 fire above uh, Durango, Colorado, uh, burned its most severe burn period between July, I believe is the 2nd and the 8th is when we were there. But on the 20th, they had an extreme precipitation event that ended up flushing extreme amounts of sediment into the Animas River down in Colorado, which you may remember is the acid mine drainage turned orange river from several years ago due to the Gold King mine spill. But that precipitation event in that burn scar released more metals than the mine spill that turned the Animas orange. So understanding the interplay between fire and erosion may allow us to better preserve some of these key areas. A large fire really only burns it severely severely intensely over about 7 to 15 percent of its area and so even a 50,000 acre fire with a heavy lift helicopter spreading you know a couple thousand acres of uh, hydro seed and mulch at relatively cheap cost compared to hand seeding or the alternatives which includes felling uh, dead trees side slope such that they provides a roughness factor for sheet wash erosion or other roughness element uh, creation such as trenching, uh, water bars across linear features, and seeding, hand seeding. Uh, these heavy lift helicopters are definitely one of the cheapest ways to go, but that requires cognizance on part of the management team during the time of the wildfire reaction to get some of these um, you know, codes that you have to charge a lot of this funding towards done. And it may not seem as important as, say, putting out the smoke, which is what the public cares about. So again, it comes down to perception, um, which can be frustrating for the operators on the ground. And then the people that care about the water quality, they see the correlation between the smoke and dead fish. But uh, just bridging that gap is, again, one of the greatest battles we face. I would again refer you to the cited materials I have in the folder at which you clicked on this video. Uh, they are provided by the Joint Fire Science Program, which is an incredible, they conduct incredible studies across a variety of climates, ecotones, what have you, um, concerning fire and its effects across time and space. Uh, their studies on rehabilitation after fire have been of great interest to me, specifically hill slope erosion control and road rehabilitation. And these sources, some of them I think are, you know, between six years and maybe 10 years old at this point, but they're constantly coming out with new stuff. It's all publicly available because these are government funded organizations. And I, I would encourage you to review these as well as some of these fire predictive models. Some of them are pretty incredible, uh, especially when you pair it with something like GeoWeb 
Um, the Geospatial Erosion Prediction Protocol, I believe, is the acronym. But GeoWEP is extremely useful for dividing up any watershed um, provided by Google Earth or any like KMZ file. You can um, divide into subcatchments of different contributing area, and then you can further define roughness elements based on the already occurring uh, fuel loading, vegetation uh, aspect, rock fragment percentage of exposed soil, everything you want. And it's been immensely helpful for me for routing um, precipitation events over parts of watersheds or entire watersheds through time and space and then changing roughness elements and contributing you know factors on the soil side of things to erosion potential and it doesn't quite get to mass wasting and debris flow dynamics but that might be a more site specific um, candidate for study but highly recommend highly recommend